Ryan, Jason, uh, welcome to Iceland. Thank welcome you. to Startup Iceland. Um, I first wanted to start. Um, you are not from Boulder. You are uh, from Detroit, and you went to school, and you lived from in California. Correct. You were in the Silicon Valley. So what made you move to Boulder, of all places? So uh, I think Jason and I probably have slightly different answers. Uh, we, we were together at a previous fund, Mobius Venture Capital, um, the four of us who started Foundry Group. And uh, when it became clear that Mobius was not going to uh, continue to exist in its current uh, incarnation, uh, we, we decided to start um, a new venture fund, a smaller venture fund. Um, and two of us, Jason and myself, were based in California, and two of us, uh, Seth and Brad Feld, were, 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 were based in Colorado. And uh, you know, we decided it, it didn't make any sense to have a small four partner venture fund that had uh, two geographic locations. Um, and uh, you know, despite the fact that uh, conventional wisdom might say that, uh, well, if you're gonna pick one of those two, you would, uh, you, you would choose Silicon Valley. Uh, we were, uh, I think, being a little contrarian in our thinking and looking for a, uh, looking for a change and a way to do things differently. And uh, we took the plunge in 2006 and uh, moved to Boulder. Ryan's much more charitable. <laughs> We, we screwed up Mobius good. <laughs> Wanted to start over. I went to school in Ann Arbor. I, I was tired of the Silicon Valley hype machine and having to drive up and down 280 and friction and people talking out of their you know what's. And I said, let's go to Boulder and start all over where there's some real people who can build real startups. <laughs> How about that? So uh, now that we have the Boulder story um, <laughs> straight. <laughs> I'll try to be less politic in my next answer. <laughs> uh, well, Brad, was, Brad was a little less uh, straight about it too. But he moved there because it was Amy who dragged him there. Um, you, you know, bringing it into the context of Iceland, and of course I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer of uh, building startups the same way you described it, you know. You just need um, some motivated people, somebody a little bit crazy, and then you just get started. Um, in the context of Iceland, you know, uh, you know, obviously all the elements about Iceland the president reverted to are real and true. But you have been investing in startups. You've been doing this for the past, I don't know, hour long. Um, what do you think Iceland should be looking at, you know? From, from your experience moving to Boulder? So, so, I mean, I think you need to take, uh, basically create an asset map of what you have and what you don't have. Your strengths and your weaknesses and figure out what those are. Clearly the strengths are there's a ton of entrepreneurs, ton of ideas, ton of smart people, free energy or cheap energy. I mean, a whole bunch of stuff that's just, you know, yay, yay, yay. Um, what's more unclear is what are the policies that are gonna allow foreign people to come and invest. You know, the U.S. technically could have all of its VC investing done internally to, to, with the U.S. I think you want to encourage outsiders to come invest. How's the currency work back and forth? How do the employment laws change? You know, there's a whole bunch of regulatory stuff that more, more or less we just don't know, uh, know what the answer is from the outside. Uh, so educating us. And then where you're weak, really trying to be strong. And I think one of the things, that, you know, Ryan and I have noticed over the last uh, 24 hours, you're very, very much like Boulder in that everybody's helping each other out. You know, we call it coopetition, where people are really, really trying to help to success, and that you don't see that in everywhere. The Silicon Valley does not have that, by the way. It's every man for himself. Mm -hmm. um, but places like Boulder, places like New York, believe it or not, are very, very, uh, you know, coopetition uh, ecosystem, and I think that's a strength of yours. But, you know, making sure that the policies are aligned so that it's easy to get money in and out uh, mm -hmm. is, is very important. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, taking a, a long-term view, right, uh, uh, you know, our partner Brad's Startup Communities book really talks about the notion of, you know, fostering um, an entrepreneurial ecosystem. You know, you have to be playing long ball and you have to recognize that it's a, you know, 10, 20, 30 year, um, you know, kind of, uh, kind of mission where you are really, um, you know, w where you're recognizing that it's not any one company or any one startup that, that's, that's going to sort of all of a sudden create um, you know, create and foster an entrepreneurial ecosystem, but that it is a process um, and, and really sort of bringing together all of the members of the community, whether it's, for, you know, angel investors, the entrepreneurs, you know, the, the services around it, law firms, accountants, et cetera. And then, of course, you know, the government um, being involved in a way to set up 
the environment, but but be mostly hands off, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you know, all of those things are, are necessary, and the and sort of the long. It's a process, right? As opposed to something you can sort of, right. you know, arrive at instantaneously. Right. I mean, um, you you've been here for a couple of days, and and you've been you know traveling the city and taking your own uh, view of the place. Uh, it's a it's a small town, but. Um, what a small town has, you know, there are some strengths with a small town, the connectivity, the fact that you can get access to people. How important is that for a startup? Well, you know, we're 98,000 people in Boulder, and we are the number four ranked uh, vent or location for early stage startup investing in 2012. I don't know what 2013 will be like, but in 2012, it, uh, New York, uh, San Francisco, New York, and Boston, and then Colorado was next, and 98% of that's happening in Boulder. So effectively, a town of 100,000 people can do it. Mm -hmm. um, now, how it scales and how it grows, we're on the same journey you. We don't know. Yeah. Um, but we do believe that you can get to somewhere really, really meaningful with a small amount of people if everybody's really focused and, and celebrate failure and celebrate achievement and, and not become you know, uh, egomaniacs about success and not get too down when you fail. And so it can happen, but the, it's, everybody does need to work together. Yeah, but the you know the size and accessibility of uh, of the town and the community uh, is a real asset. Um, we certainly saw that in Boulder. You know, upon arriving in Boulder um, in 2006, uh, Jason started something called the Boulder Open Coffee Club, which is patterned after the Open Coffee Club model. Which you know, you search on Google, you'll you'll find it. There's a lot of them all over the place. Maybe there's even one in Reykjavik. Mm -hmm. If not, there should be. Um, but but you know that was sort of Jason's. Uh, uh, Jason's way to, you know, infiltrate himself into the community very quickly by hosting this event, you, you know, once a month on a, on a Tuesday morning. And, uh, you know, the ability to do something like that um, in Boulder and just sort of part of the DNA of the community, which is more collaborative, um, is, is a benefit and an asset to a small town because you do have um, you know, physical and social proximity and a way for, you know, newcomers into the community to get dialed in very quickly. And that's, uh, you know, that's important and something I think that, that uh, Reykjavik and, uh, and Boulder share. Um, I mean, we just uh, heard Taleb talk about anti-fragile and, and, you know, things that gain from disorder. And uh, I, I don't have to repeat myself, you know, Iceland went through a major reset. And uh, those kind of resets are fantastic uh, opportunities from the way I see the world. And that's what made me go a little crazy and start just going all out. Uh, so so how, how important is it for people to take chances like that? You know, uh, uh, you know so, sometimes uh, w Iceland being between Europe and America, uh, one of the things we always gravitate towards the European side and say, oh, we, we are very European. And then when I talk to some of the other Icelanders, they're like, oh, no, we're more like the Americans. We are a lot more entrepreneurial. We like to take chances. Um, you know, just, just having that opportunity to take chances, how important is that? And, 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 and not feeling small about it. Can, can you elaborate on that? Well, I'll, uh, you know, since, since I took it as my homework assignment on the airplane to, to, to read, uh, uh, read Anti-Fragile on the way over, I'll, I'll touch on that uh, briefly, right? One of the, uh, you know, I think risk-taking is obviously crucially important for an entrepreneurial ecosystem. And, you know, uh, I think one of the points that, that Taleb makes is, you know, uh, anti-fragility exists in an ecosystem or in a species. Um, where, where one unfortunate consequence of that is that um, you know the individual in that ecosystem may it, it may not be anti-fragile, right? And that's and that's all about em embracing failure, right? The the reason an entrepreneurial ecosystem works over generations and improves is because you know there are companies that fail along the way, and in fact, m you know most of them fail along the way or don't reach you know sort of the end goal that they they set out to do, and that that. But that's a, a vital and important part of the process, right? Which is recognizing that you know it is uh, building a successful entrepreneurial ecosystem is an evolutionary process, and a very important part of evolution is uh, you know survival of the fittest, right? And that they, it's not about the health of the ecosystem; it's not about any one company or any one employee, but it's really about sort of the learning that occurs over time. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I thought that was very applicable, and and just saying, you know. If you really need to change your, your, your viewpoint and say, you know, this, uh, you need to embrace failure because it's a, a crucially important part of, uh, of progress, of right? Strength, and, of and, gaining and, strength. And, and of strength, so. It's, it's, the, it's the master's class of startups, it's failing. Yes. In yeah. fact, we're so uh, scared of success 
that if we see an entrepreneur who's only had success, that's usually somebody we're not going to back. <laughs> and you feel you're, you, you need to have that to keep you you're cemented. Yeah, yeah, some of our favorite entrepreneurs to back have had a, you know, had a success and a failure in, in their past. And, uh, you know, that sort of optimizes the level of, uh, you know, humility and tenacity you know, mm -hmm. in the individual. So, uh, Jason, I'd like to address this question to you. You are playing a role in trying to rebuild Detroit, which is uh, known for the auto industry and everything related to the auto industry. So how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I need, need a scotch, not water. Um, <laughs> it's going. Um, we, we, we currently have a, a, a gentleman by the name of Danny Gilbert who owns the Cleveland Cavaliers and Quicken Loans who is pouring billions of dollars into the city and trying to create the, a safe work environment and places for people to go. And that may sound table stakes, considering I hear your, your, your uh, policemen don't even carry guns around here. But that is a very big thing that has to be done. Uh, there are startups moving downtown. We are trying to pull in all the universities together and get off their, you know, Michigan State versus Michigan, all that, get them all down in Detroit, help out. And, you know, the big thing has been a cultural shift. Like failure in Detroit meant you were a failure. If you went mm -hmm. bankrupt, you were a failure. If you're in Silicon Valley, you're a, fail a failure means you're an entrepreneur. I mean, it was completely just viewed differently. And, you know, the, the meltdown has changed attitudes. So first was attitudes changing, education what this is, education that these things are good. Um, there are there's some activity. There's some venture funds. There's, you know, probably 50 or 60 startups in downtown now, which, mm -hmm. is, which is great. You know, the thing we're going to face down there, which is really hard, is the educational system. Mm -hmm. The city of Detroit does not have the residents that are working in these jobs. And what the plan is to retrain the, the workforce down there, that's a plan that nobody has yet. And without that, what you're going to do is create a, an area where a whole bunch of people go and they have their jobs and they leave at night. Mm -hmm. Or people come, becomes a commuter city, which won't, you know, impact Detroit in the way that they want it to be. But mm -hmm. it's baby steps there. It's better than it was five years ago. I mean, five mm -hmm. years, years ago, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. So I guess we should claim some success, but there's a long way to go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, what I found interesting about Detroit and the fact that you're doing that is, um, you know, Iceland has a very creative class. I mean, arts, you know, uh, music, uh, the, the, the creative side of it was something that really impressed me when I came here first and started looking at how it is fostered from very young age. Um, do you think the creative class is what's needed in a city like Detroit? A creative class is needed anywhere you want startups. And I think the more creative is helpful. I mean, if you look at sort of the artist creation classes, then turn into technical creation classes, and then those turn into startups, and that, that's the seed. So you know, the first step was getting the, the artists down there, the mm -hmm. musicians and whatnot, and that kind of fostered. The same thing you see in Portland, yeah. same sort of way I grew up, same thing in Boulder. We were a hippie town. Mm -hmm. um, some would argue we still are, um, <laughs> but uh, it's, you know, that, that's how it started. Yeah. Uh, so, Ryan, I have one question for you. You are part of the first search engine, and that's not Google, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> really? You missed it by that much. Missed it by <laughs> that much, a little bit. But, but, but you had your own success, and, and uh, that, that's actually quite exciting, because I used to use Excite, and uh, I don't want to show my age, but I used to use that too. Anyway, can you, can you share a little bit about Excite and that journey and, and, and what that taught you? Sure. Well, I'll, I'll try to uh, condense, uh, you know, a story that I could, you know, go on for, for hours about. Um, when I, in 1993, it was my senior year at, at Stanford, and five of my classmates and I decided that, uh, you know, it would be a lot more interesting to go work for ourselves than, than, than someone else. And we, we, we naively, uh, very naively, chose uh, search engines as a, as a field that was interesting to us because we were all interested in the intersection of computation and, and natural language and had this sort of simple observation that, hey, there's a lot of companies out there making database software handling the structured data problem, but that we, uh, that the unstructured data problem, you know, normal documents, making them searchable, you know, had hardly been addressed. We thought we were going to be an enterprise software company when we started. Um, and uh, so we built a prototype search engine that ran on a, the command line on Unix, uh, and you know we went out and tried to demo it to people, and you know no one understood what we were talking about. It's really hard to you know convince most people who are who are not uh, programmers 
what it is that they're even seeing when you're, when you're searching on the command line. And so we wrote a web interface for it because it was our only way to sort of put a, a GUI in front of it quickly. Um, and went out and started demoing it to people. We needed a set of documents to search and we said, well, there's this web thing that's kind of nascent, right? It was, it was 1993. Let's write a spider that gathers these documents so that we can search it for a demo. And this was all in service of you know, going to try and sell enterprise software. Um, <laughs> Uh, so through no fault of our own, we became uh, known as those guys who were doing that web search engine thing. Um, I didn't know that venture capital existed. We sort of through a series of uh, random meetings, you know, wound up meeting uh, Vinod Kosla, who was the founder of Sun Microsystems, a partner at Kleiner Perkins, and he and Jeff Yang from uh, now Redpoint, but formerly I IVP, offered to invest in us, right? And we were six guys, we had no idea what we were doing, um, but we had built something interesting. Uh, you know, we, we launched Excite in, uh, uh, the, to the public in October of 1995, and it just took off, right? We went from, and again, we weren't sure of our business model, but we started selling some advertising, and you know, we went in our first year, 12 million ad revenues to you know, 48 the next year, and over 100 the, the year after that. And um, you know, went public along the way in 1996. Uh, just you know, an incredible wild ride. Um, that uh, you know, also in the end, we merged with a company called At Home and the combined company in 2000, uh, 2001, 2002. Ultimately, uh, wound up failing right after becoming you know profitable before the sort of internet bubble burst. Um, and so, you know, I really saw both, you know, the extreme up and the, uh, and the extreme down. So, uh, you know, that, that also, I think, instilled a dose, uh, you know, Jason's, uh, you know, uh, mentioning, you know, be, be humble, right, even in, the, uh, even in the most successful scenarios, you know, went from a, a company that was, was nothing to a multi-billion dollar market cap and back down to nothing again. And that was quite an education in, uh, you know, in the boom and bust cycle in, uh, in technology. Yeah, excellent. Uh, I want to change it a bit. Uh, both of you are part of a band, <laughs> and, and, and uh, we have seen, uh, you know, who can forget I'm a VC video. <laughs> I mean, I, I was really hoping that both of you would come in that outfit, but, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll settle for what you have. But can you tell us a little bit about the, the, the band and, and, and the creative side of what you, what you do? And, you know, there's, there's more to a VC than what you see, so... So, so he gets the question about the company he founded, and I get the question about wearing a wig and mascara. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's fair. <laughs> uh, no, I, you know, it's funny. We met um, in 2000 uh, at Mobius, and I remember distinctively deciding I was not going to like Ryan. He's, he wasn't my type of guy. Um, he was one of these internet millionaires, successful. I was from, you know, chip on a shoulder from Detroit kid. I didn't have, you know, a lawyer. None of these guys know anything. They're all just lucky. Um, seriously, that's, that was what my attitude was. And we got together and played some music, and it changed our, our lives and our careers forever. We've been playing together 15, 14 years. Um, the I'm a VC video was our homage to the Saturday Night Live Justin Timberlake uh, videos we decided to do uh, as VCs. I ironically, the, the hate mail we got from VCs was, was pretty heavy. So really? Uh, <laughs> yeah, here, this tells you a lot about the U.S. US venture I, I capital industry. Fantastic. So the, the, the entrepreneurs loved it. Yeah. Our investors loved it. <laughs> and there were enough venture caps like, you're demeaning the industry. And I'm like, do you read the paper about VCs? <laughs> it's it's kind of like lawyers and undertakers and venture capitalists. Like, we're, <laughs> what are we doing that hasn't been done? Um, we have another one on the way. Oh, I, I, we, I guess as a first public announcement, we have one. Wow. That's what, at the end of the year, we'll have another one. But we also have a serious band uh, that we do. It's called Legitimate Front. We're on Spotify. If you want to listen to it, 70s music, all original. We just got done two days uh, playing the Great American Music Hall in San Francisco recently. Awesome. But, so, but it, it helps us. I, I got to tell you, the advantages are besides just being a lot of fun. Um, it's been great to connect with entrepreneurs. It's amazing how many high-performing technical people have been musicians. And, and, you know, I say that when you're diligencing a human being and trying to decide if you're going to invest in a company, it's a lot like dating. I want to fall in love. And one of those ways you can fall in love is over music and shared experiences. And so I think it's been, it's been good. It's differentiated. He and I kept us sane. And, and, you know, it's been a good branding thing for the founder group, if nothing else. And, you know, Brad can't dance, and I just love putting a video <laughs> camera in front of him and making him that nervous. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm waiting for a mem about him dancing, you know, just going back and forth, the okay. gif. Oh, you know, I have uh, outtakes from the last video of him trying to sing that I, you know, I'm going to save for something special. Yeah. 
Excellent. Um, I, I think we are starting to run out of time. I, I want to wrap this uh, panel up. But um, so if you had one advice for an uh, entrepreneur, what would that be? You're starting, somebody's starting out, somebody's thinking about starting out, and they have this epiphany like I did. What, what, would, you, what would you advise them? Well, you know, I would say, uh, much, much like you did, uh, you know, recognize that uh, you should just go do it, right? I mean, it'll, it will be, you know, no, no, no fully sane person goes into the process, uh, you know, understanding exactly how intense it's going to be. Um, but that's, that's not a reason not to do it. Um, you know, referring, looking at, you know, some of the biggest companies, uh, you know, in the U.S., uh, you know, were startups that were started in the aftermath of, of downturns, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's, a, you know, a Cisco Systems or Google, uh, you know, and there's a much longer list than that, but, um, you know, that sort of, you know, coming through, a, a, you know, a, a time of upheaval and, and start, it's a great time to start a company um, and, uh, and, you know, just go do it and don't be afraid to think big. I'd say find a partner. You can't do this job alone. Mm -hmm. You can't, uh, as far as I know, you can't biologically create kids alone, although there's, uh, there's some book that probably <laughs> says I'm wrong about that. Um, you got to have a partner. Mm -hmm. So the next, the flip side to the story. So if you are starting out to be an investor, as an angel investor, you have, I don't know, $5,000, and everybody's talking about this uh, startup thingies. Uh, what would be your advice for investors who want to get involved, who haven't done this before, they think it's too risky, they don't want to be involved in something like this, uh, what would be your advice? Well, I think two, uh, can I give two, um, two pieces? Uh, Jeff Clavier, because it's really not my advice, Jeff Clavier, who's one of the most successful angel investors ever, has advice to angel investors, and his advice is assume you will lose all your money. Mm -hmm. So if you've gotten past that step and you still want to do it, um, realize it's about the entrepreneur, not about you. Mm -hmm. And this goes for VCs, angels, whatever. Too many people who write that check start thinking that the process is about us. We're nothing but middlemen. Mm -hmm. Y'all creating the companies out there, you're the rock stars. That's what it's about. And you have to have that attitude. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope you get to see more of Iceland. And thanks for stopping by. I hope you can do this again next year. Fun. Thank Maybe you. for Iceland Airwaves. You know, they play all these bands. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Tour and Reykjavik. <laughs> <laughs>